Hello and welcome to lesson two of the Optavia Healthy Habits Game Design Challenge. My name is Lindsay Buckle and I'm the manager of strategy here at Legends of Learning. We are so excited that you're joining us today and really excited for the presentation about prototyping that we're providing to you today. Our goal with the Game Design Challenge is to empower students through a virtual game design experience with support from game development professionals. Experts from Optavia, GameRight, Calliope Games, Ravensburger, Exploding Kittens, and Asmodee are thrilled to be able to share their wealth of knowledge with students all over the world. They'll be discussing everything from healthy habits to game development, as well as prototyping to playtesting. And if you're a winner, you'll receive a premium swag bag with games from each of these amazing companies. Today, we'll be diving into lesson two of the game design challenge. Lesson two explores how to develop your game and test out new ideas. Here to speak with you all about lesson two is Jason Snyder from GameRight. Jason is a vice president of product development for GameRight. A lifelong game maker, Jason is in charge of Game Rights game development process, from meeting with game inventors and curating new concepts to overseeing production and marketing efforts. Some of, some of his favorite titles are Sleeping Queens, Forbidden Island, and whatever latest title he's currently working on. Jason is going to dive into how to prototype your game and why it is so important to include prototyping in your game design process. After his presentation, we're gonna go ahead and open the floor for your questions. So at this point, Jason, feel free to take it away. Thanks so much, Lindsay, thanks for having me. How's it going out there, legends of learning heroes? You guys are heroes because you're game makers and anybody who's a game maker in my mind is a total hero. We need more heroes like you out there, so keep making good games. So today I am going to talk about the prototyping process, an essential part of creating your game, because without a prototype, you really can't make a game. Games gotta start somewhere. And while the idea may pop into your brain, you need to make it into a real life, actual product to test out. And that is a prototype. So with that said, I'm going to get my presentation going and let's jump into it. Can everybody see that all right? Great. How to prototype your game. So a uh, little bit, that's me. I'm Jason Schneider again. I'm vice president of product development for GameRight. We're a, a major publisher of family board games, card games, dice games based uh, in Newton, Massachusetts. So um, if you're curious about our games, maybe some of you have our games in your house. But here is a bunch of them are some of our best sellers from preschool games like Out Fox to dice games like Quicks to some strategy games uh, for Ben Island, Dragonwood. I know that's uh, Josh Goldberg's one of his favorite games, one of the founders of Legend of Learning um, and some of our great card games from Rattatat Cat, Sleeping Queens, one of my favorites, Sushi Go. And we also do a bunch of family party games ranging from Splurt to Think and Sync to In a Pickle. Um, the thing is, all of these games, they all started as prototypes. What is a prototype? Let's get into that because it's important to know what a prototype is. Maybe you know already, but just so we've got a definition on the screen, a prototype is a sample or model of a product built to test out a concept. So you've got this great concept bopping around in your noggin and you're like, I need to get this made so I can see if it really is amazing as my brain thinks it is, or whether it's something that needs further refinement. So that defines a prototype. What do you need to make a prototype? Well, you're gonna need a couple things. You're gonna need some tools and you're gonna need some materials. Let's talk about some tools first. So basic prototyping tools. You're gonna need a pencil for sketching. I mean, that's 101. Doesn't have to necessarily be a pencil, could be a pen, could be a, a stylus that you're using on your virtual tablet but something to write down some ideas, to sketch out some visions of what you think your prototype might look like. You're also gonna need a sketch pad or a notepad for keeping ideas. This is really important, not only for generating the brainstorming phase of your prototype, but also for taking notes during the testing phase of your prototype. You're gonna to wanna to look back at your notes and keep careful record of the hits and misses of your experience as you are prototyping. 
You're going to need a ruler for measuring because when it comes to a prototype, everything is going to have to be the right size. You're going to want the cards to be the right size, the board, the spaces on the board, everything to fit perfectly. So be sure to get yourself a nice long ruler too. Sometimes people get a 12 inch ruler. I recommend even getting an 18 inch ruler because especially with larger components like game boards, they go beyond 12 inches. It's good to have an extra wide ruler for that. Markers for coloring. Once you've sketched out your idea, you're going to want to fill it in somehow. And having a nice variety of markers, both permanent and washable, uh, always good to have by your side. Scissors for cutting. You're going to be making a lot of different components with your prototypes. You're going to have to cut them up and, and uh, make them into unique shapes. Now, if you really want to get fancy, you can get what's known as an X-Acto knife, uh, which gives you some really precise cuttings. Pair that up with a ruler, and you can get some really straight cuts. One warning about X-Acto knives is they're extremely, extremely sharp. So please have a parent handy or around to help you with an X-Acto knife. I don't want to hear anything about people getting into trouble with X-Acto knives, especially as they're cutting straight edges. And then tape. Tape is an important part of lots of prototypes to put things together, be it a box, be it taping cards together or parts onto a board. Always get a variety of tape from double stick tape, some masking tape, some regular old scotch tape. Those are all excellent things to keep by your side as you're prototyping your game. Now, beyond these basic prototyping tools, there's also some fancier tools that you might think about. And if you've got the resources, you might employ. So for example, you maybe have a 3D printer. Maybe your school or community center has one. This is a great way to make 3D components like pawns, like extra elements that might be unique to your game. Uh, of course, this requires having some advanced skills and being able to design in a 3D environment and also some knowledge of how 3D products are made. But there are plenty of resources online for this. And it's really cool to see a custom 3D part of your game, especially in a prototype. A laser cutter. This is another really awesome fancy prototyping tool that a lot of professional prototypers use. And this helps you make some extremely fast and fine cuts, be it on paper, on cardboard, on wood. Uh, you can cut out lots of great things. You can etch with a laser cutter as well too. And again, I bet many of your local community resource centers, some of the, sometimes the high school shops have them a good thing to get access to. And then there's the trusty laminator. When you're making a prototype, you want it to be durable because it's going to go through a lot of tests. And a laminator often comes in handy for getting just the right coating, get the right thickness for your cards or for your components to make sure they stay together through that wide testing process. Now, I mentioned all these cool, fancy prototyping tools. You know what? You can put all of them away. You don't need any of them in my mind. Actually, the best prototyping tool that you all have is right actually behind your eyes in between your ears. It's your brain. That's right. Your brain is an amazing prototyping tool. It's a great problem solver and you should use it at all times to create the greatest prototypes that you're able to make. Now, so you've got your tools, you've got what you've got your brain, you've got your knives, you've got your scissors, you've got your pencils, you've got your, uh, your even if you're lucky enough, you've got a 3D printer. You're also going to need some materials. What are you going to make your prototype with? So here's some basic prototyping materials that you're going to want to have at the ready. Cardboard boxes. These are my favorite, all kinds of them, be it a pizza box, which you can cut up and use to make a board, cereal boxes because of their density and they're, they're also wide enough, shoe boxes for holding stuff, all kinds of boxes. So look around the house, maybe you've got some leftover shipping boxes, but cardboard boxes are just an essential for making a great prototype. What else? Ziploc bags. Surely you've got some in the kitchen drawer somewhere. This is a great component to have for putting stuff in, whether it's tokens for a game, whether it's some money, little things, dice, whatever it is, Ziploc bags are another essential for keeping handy for making a prototype. And similarly, plastic containers. This is a, 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 another way to hold your component, hold your game pieces so that they stay clean between test cycles and also you can keep them organized as well too. I know some game designers have different colored plastic containers for the different styles of games, different sizes as well too. A really nice thing to have at your side. What else? Playing cards. Well, most board games, card games that we have in our line and that are out there in the world of games involve cards of some sort. 
And you've got a variety of options in that regard. You've got your standard 52 card playing deck, which you can see on the left. And those are really neat. You can keep them as is. You can marker over them. I've seen that before. People taking a regular, you know, the numbers on them, just using the number cards if they've got a number focused game. But you can also find out pretty uh, easily, there's a, there's a lot of people making blank playing cards. And that's what's in the middle of the, the bottom there. You can see, you can just go and buy white playing cards. And I'll show you an example of a prototype later of an inventor who used just those to make his prototype. Um, they're available at most online stores. Most craft stores have white, just plain white playing cards. And the reason why you want to get plain white playing cards and not just any kind of card or paper is because they shuffle really well. You can feel the, the, actually the, the texture, the, the core of the card, what's inside the card is really good for extended playing. If you decide not to use that, or even if you do, you might want to get some card sleeves. These plastic or um, they're acetate, they go over a card and it makes it really easy to swap ideas. If you've got a, either a playing card or a blank card and a card sleeve, you could then use some paper to change out ideas as you're iterating, as you're making changes to your game, the card sleeve serves as like the frame for the entire game experience. And that way you don't have to make a completely new card deck every single time you're gonna be play testing and prototyping your game. What other kind of materials can you use? Well, dice, of course. Uh, they're very easy to find. You can go to your local pharmacy and get them. Uh, that, that I said, you know, CVS has them. Pretty much all stores, grocery stores have them. They're an essential part of most games that, that you uh, play with. And so there's different styles of dice. I'm showing your standard six-sided dice, but there's also 12-sided dice, 20-sided dice, four-sided dice. So get a whole bunch of dice ready uh, at, the, at your side when you're looking at prototype. You never know what you're gonna need and have several of each because you never know if some game is gonna have a couple. This, like for example, my game got two six-sided dice, but maybe some games need four or eight or 12. The more dice you have, the better. Stickers, oh, I love stickers. Why? Several reasons. They're great for making quick changes to your prototype. You can either get a printed sheet uh, or you can get some on a roll that you can then use to just change out the grid for marking colors. You can see the stickers that are there. If you wanted to, you could easily make a five suit uh, deck using just five stickers, just by putting a sticker on each of the cards. Automatically, you've started off to have something that could be built into your prototype. Sticker sheets are great too, and that takes it up to another level. You know, if you really are computer savvy, you could print out a lot of your materials on stickers and then stick them right away. You can set it up either on a Google Doc or a Word Doc and then do a mail merge right to a sticker or right to a, a printable card. Excellent way to, get to prototype quickly when you need to. Arts and crafts. We all have a, lots of stuff around our house. Pom-poms, uh, string, um, the googly guys, whatever it is, the more fun and colorful components you can add to your game, the better. So look around and see what's available in your arts and crafts cabinet or in your drawers in your house. Surely maybe your teachers, your art teacher has some things they can lend you, but think about what's available when you're making your prototype that can really enhance your game and make it look splashy. Recycled materials. We talked earlier about some of the boxes, but there's more than just boxes you can recycle to make into your prototype. You've got caps from the top of a bottle that you could use as a pawn or some chips. You've got toilet paper rolls, which you could use to make tunnels or you could use them as columns, depending on the kind of game that you're stacking. Buttons, the same thing, could be used as currency. So think about in your prototype form, it doesn't have to be perfect. What you're looking for is just something to represent your final product. Right now, you don't have the ability to make lots of little coins. Get a bunch of buttons to do so or pull some bottle caps together from your leftover drinks that you had the other night. And the biggest prototyping material that I recommend to other people is old board games. That's right. You have a board game sitting in your closet that you haven't played for years. Surely you could loot that board game and find some pawns. You can find a board that you may be able to use. You might find some cards. Reusing old board games is a great way of prototyping a new board game flipping it over in a component over on its bag, or just using the component, component for what it is can make all the difference in making your component, making your prototype look and feel like a real game. So what do prototypes look like? We've seen all these components. What is a prototype actually like in real life? Well, I pulled together some of the prototypes that have come through my office that I've seen over the years that I thought were worth sharing with you 
and with the larger community. So let's take a look at them. We're gonna start off with a prototype for what became a game called Dragonwood. But you can see here, this was Forest Quest. This was the inventor's copy of it. And there those are, there are the white blank playing cards with magic markers that the inventor used. In the back, you can see that green box. That's actually a deck box that's used for playing Magic the Gathering and Pokemon. That's what the inventor stored all the stuff in. And he just took a marker and wrote across the top of it. Um, he had a big card back to it, said FQ Adventurer and over on the right, uh, FQ Forest, and you can see that he just, without doing any illustrations, wrote the name of the card and the powers and the abilities right on top of it there, which I thought was great because at its essence, this game really all it needs is some cards and some numbers and some simple iconography. Now, when we play the game, we the game shown through despite the fact that the prototype didn't have much going on for it art-wise. We love the game, and that's one of the things you want to keep in mind as you're prototyping your game. Don't worry about the art, worry about the game playing experience because in the end, the game turned into this, Dragonwood. You're gonna see some of the, uh, the, the changes we did. You can see in the, on the bottom right corner, there's the orange dragon. Look for the orange dragon here in the prototype. You can see it all it said is orange dragon with a number seven and some symbols. And we kept that same method of putting the name of the orange dragon up top. We added a cool picture of it, illustrated by an incredible illustrator named Chris Beatrice. And we kind of gave it, a, gave it a nice feel. And the same thing with these adventure cards. If you look on the left side there, you'll see that six and that 10 and the 11. And then again, you'll see the number of the adventure cards on the top right next to the box here, the six, seven, and eight. We just kind of gave it a little bit more theme and more feeling to it. But you basically have the same exact game between what the prototype was and what the final game became. Next, I'm gonna show you a game that's not quite ready for prime time. We're working on it. It's gonna be a game we're releasing in 2022. It's called Octopi. And this is the inventor's prototype. And I loved a few things about it. One, the box in the back, they just found a nice gift box to store it in, a round box. Um, and then this inventor found a white plastic die on the market and then with some stickers, there are those stickers, made the six sides and put stickers on it. And then the both the tokens and then the actual pie pieces are laminated. They use a laminator and just printed out on the printer using their color printer and then went to a, a laminator and really made some nice double sided tiles. But my favorite component is the one in the middle. Anybody know what that is? Yep, that is a plumber's pipe cap, right? That you can see it's a PVC pipe cap that they used and made into an octopus head. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure you're wondering what we did with it, where it went to from there. It actually was pretty close. If you look here, you can see this is the game as it's going to be coming out next year. We've got, you can see the same style that we enhanced it because the game's called Octopi. We, instead of using stars, we put some pies in there and we made a slightly more professionally shaped octopus head. But I, I'll tell you, I really do like what the inventor did originally with the plastic pipe cap, the PVC pipe cap. Sushi Roll, another very popular game in our line is Sushi Go. And the inventor of Sushi Go wanted to create a dice version of their game. And so this, they sent in a prototype for Sushi Roll. And you can see it right there in front of you. Again, using some more professional illustrating skills. I think they're pretty well versed in Photoshop and Illustrator. Those are also good tools to have if you've got that at your ready. And they made some nicely designed boards. And you can see the dice in the back along with, there's that container. I love containers. And I put the whole game in there and shipped the game to me in containers. There's also some little wood tokens and wood chips that are in the game. Um, but those, those dice that you see are just stickered on. They found some dice that were existing and printed out on stickers and made some lovely prototype dice for it. And here's what Sushi Roll looks like these days. Yep, I mean, more or less the same again, enhanced. We actually did some uh, professionally debossed dice, meaning we we're able to carve the shapes into the dice and they've really got a nice feel to it. But the basic idea of what Phil Walker Harding, the inventor of Sushi Roll, created in his prototype stayed true to the game. Forbidden Sky. Now we've got this great series of cooperative games starting off with Forbidden Island and then Forbidden Desert. And our last uh, introduction in the series is called Forbidden Sky. This was created by a prolific game designer named Matt Leacock. And this was his prototype for Forbidden Sky. So what you're seeing is a combination of a bunch of different things. Now, by far, this is our most sophisticated, this is one of the most sophisticated prototypes that I've seen in my years looking at prototypes. And Matt's a veteran at making prototypes, so he's excellent at it. He uses a lot of digital tools 
to make things. But right in the middle, you can see this, this kind of helicopter looking um, rocket that's made out of some foam pieces. And you actually solder together a little engine underneath all those foam pieces. And if you're looking around the rocket, you can see these copper shaped pieces. They actually create a full circuit. So he had a full stem circuit going on in his game. And I thought it was amazing that it actually worked every time that when you connected all the pieces together, uh, the positive and the negative connected, and all of a sudden the, ro the, the helicopter rotated or the, the propeller rotated at the top. Um, but in addition to that, he has some other tr uh, traditional part, more parts of a prototype. You can see some paper clips he's using. Those are card protectors, that blue and the green at the bottom there. And he just printed out on some pieces of paper and cut up the different uh, words, the different parts of the cards. And like I said, there's, there's lots of just traditional prototyping elements here. He took pawns from other games to make it. Um, so this is kind of a hybrid of some really vanguard techniques, some really cutting edge techniques of prototyping and some traditional ones as well too. I'm sure you're curious to know what Forbidden Sky shaped up to be. There it is. So we did keep a rocket. It doesn't have a propeller at the top, but it does light up. And we've got, you can see the components, not real copper, but we molded some plastic and we kept the basic idea of it. And we also molded some clips. You can see on the medic, instead of using paper clips, we've got these nice molded plastic clips to go there. But we kept the basic idea. You can see how much of an influence Matt's prototype had on the final design for the game. Now, of all the many games that we put out, one of my favorite stories of all times is the story of Sleeping Queens, because guess what? It was created by a six-year-old girl. Yep, she had a dream one morning or one night, and she woke up with this dream about these queens that were needing to be wake, woken up by kings. And so she wrote it down along with her family, and her mom emailed in her idea for the game, and it came to my email box, and I was immediately taken by it. A couple things struck, stuck, struck me about it. One was the fact that it had these cool characters I had never seen before. And the second is that the game had a little element of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which I'm sure you've played before on the playground or somewhere. But that, I thought I'd never seen that before in a card game. So I asked the family to make a prototype, to make it sketch up a game. And the first time they sent in a game, it actually was a regular deck of cards just marked over, like I suggested. But then after that, the family took the time to illustrate some custom illustrations for Sleeping Queens. So I'm going to share with you some of the original pictures from the prototype of Sleeping Queens. Now, don't freak out when you see them. Obviously, the family had some really good artistic talent, but you can do it too. So here it was. These are some of the queens for the 12, the 12 queens for the Sleeping Queens games as illustrated by the family, the Evarts family that created the game. You can see we've got uh, the Rainbow Queen, the Iris Queen, the Cat Queen, the Queen of Babies. Actually, that's a queen that never even made it into the uh, game. That's a little that's a little Easter egg right there. Um, some jesters. We've got the um, which actually are still made into the game. These arrows, which didn't make it in, but they wound up being converted into some sleeping potion. And then you can see the backs of the queen cards and the backs of the king cards. And then some princes. Actually, we took the princes out and we replaced them with knights. That was the one thing that happened. And there it is, that's Sleeping Queens. You can see right there, one of our best-selling card games. If you haven't checked it out for yourself, you're gonna to wanna to get a copy. It's a really good inspiration about how you can make a prototype and have it become a full-fledged game. Okay, so you build a prototype. You've gotten all your materials, you've got your tools, you've got all your materials, and you made your prototype. Awesome, congratulations, but now what do you do? So here are some prototyping best practices. Let's go through them. One is, like I said earlier, keep a prototype testing journal. This is an excellent way of keeping track of your prototypes. You can look back and see what kind of things did you do right? What kind of things could you improve upon in your next prototype that you're gonna be making uh, in, if there's any that are needed? Don't aim for perfection on the first try. This is, I cannot over, uh, overstate how important this is. When you're building your prototype, you don't need it to be perfect. It doesn't need to look like a real live game that you're gonna see on the shelf of a game shop or toy store. Just make something that you can kind of get your idea out in front of other people. You remember that the Dragon Realm, a Dragonwood uh, prototype I showed you? Was that by any way a perfect prototype? No, but it got the idea across of the game. And that's really what you're looking for while you're, while you're early prototyping. Test, test, test. I cannot tell you 
This is the most important part of prototyping, testing out your ideas, putting it in front of people. Start off with your family. Start off with if you've got siblings, your mom or dad, grandparents, aunts and uncles, get your idea, get your idea once it's in physical form in front of people and get some feedback. See what works, what doesn't work, what can be improved, what needs more time to develop. When you're having your testing, uh, your testing sessions, focus on the player experience. Again, don't worry about it being perfect. Look and see, like, are the rules of your prototype clear? Are the components easy to understand? Do you know exactly what the symbols mean? Are the board spaces far enough apart from each other? Can you fit pawns in? Look for all those things as you're testing your prototype. Iterate, now this is a big word, but this is a really important part of the prototyping phase. Make changes based upon feedback. And iteration is a change based upon some feedback that you got on your game. Try something new. Was the color off? Maybe you didn't have the right mix of colors in the game. Maybe things were not legible enough. You didn't have the right font that you were using, or it was too busy, or the spaces between lines on a board were just too tight. You couldn't fit all the pawns in there, or the cards didn't shuffle well in your hand. All those things, keep notes of that in your journal and make some changes that will improve your game, improve your prototype to be better for the next time. Then test it again. You saw me saying test, test, test earlier. I will say it over and over again. Testing is the most important part of the prototype process. Figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and just stick to it. Now, here's one thing I'm gonna leave you with. And this is a mantra that I say, not only to prototypers, but just in life. There's a formula. Patience plus persistence equals perseverance. If you can be patient enough to go through the process of making the prototype and the persistence that even if you start getting knocked down, even if your ideas don't work the first time or the second time or the third time, you keep at it, you keep iterating, you keep trying and refining your prototype, you will persevere. You will make a prototype that will speak to the people that you wanted to and that you can be proud of. And that's ultimately what you wanna do is make a prototype you can feel proud of that represents whatever your idea was at the very beginning of this whole process was to a T. So there you have it. Your quick down and dirty about prototypes. Thanks so much for listening and for looking along. I would love to take any questions if you have them. I'll open the floor to that. If you don't have any questions to offer right now, certainly you can get in touch through Legends of Learning. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the prototyping process. Thanks again. Wow, Jason, thank you so much. Um, I am absolutely so inspired by all of the prototyping examples that you showcased. You know, so doable with all the materials that we already have and kind of what you can make with them um, into almost a real game. Totally. I'm inspired every time I see a prototype come in from an inventor to know what kind of, just knowing they didn't have the professional, most of them didn't have the professional uh, tools available to them to create their game to be something that's so polished that they still made something that the game shines through. And that's ultimately what I'm looking for. Does the game shine through the prototype? So um, I hope that there's stuff out there that you as a viewer are gonna get inspired by to create some really awesome prototypes. Yeah, absolutely. So we are gonna go ahead and open up the floor to questions now. Um, so feel free to use the chat or the question answer box to send in your questions for either myself about the challenge or for Jason about prototyping. Um, but I do know that one question came in while you were talking, Jason. So we can yeah. get started with that one. Yeah. Um, the question was, how do I know when my prototype is ready? Oh my goodness. Well, what you do is you have to stick a fork in it. And if it doesn't come out with any goo, oh wait, that's baking. Ah, so, uh, um, that's a, it's a really tough question to answer easily. I would say you're gonna wanna gauge the responses of your testers. You're gonna wanna look for things like, do they wanna play the game again? Do they have a fun time playing it? And you should really ask them some of these questions. Are there, I and mean, you can ask them right out very plainly, are there things about this game that you could see me improving? And if they are not saying anything too harsh or too uh, severe, then you know you're on the right track. You know you're getting really close. You have to sort of set your goals at the beginning of the prototyping process pretty cleanly. Like, what kind of game do you want this to be? I know we're doing a lot of games this term about 
healthy habit. So is the game achieving your healthy habit uh, objective? In addition to that, is the game, does it fit into the right time frame? Is it for the right age group? So think about all those things as you're building your game, as you're making your prototype. And if after testing two or three or four times, you're getting to the place where you feel like the people who are testing it are giving you the answers you want, I think you know you've made a great prototype. Yes, that is such a good point. That it's really kind of about that play testing and about what the people who are playing are saying about the game. Yep, totally. Awesome. Well, we have another question that came in um, that I can probably answer. So what if you are making a digital game or a video game? So um, we do a digital a video game challenge in the spring. And so the options we always give students to prototype are, you know, kind of the basic game development platforms that you've probably already heard of. So Scratch, Roblox Studios, you can use Unity, you can use the Unreal Engine or a variety of other options that are available for free for students to use to build games and try out different ideas in more of a digital or video game context. Yep. I mean, I should say as an, uh, as an ad that there are a couple of platforms, digital platforms for making physical games too. There's one called Tabletopia and there's another one called Tabletop Simulator, which you can import a lot of your digital files to and the, you get a virtual table and you can play with people virtually. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I don't think it, anything matches the real physical playing a game experience. So whereas obviously playing a digital game, a video game, you are only playing on the screen, nothing quite matches the experience of playing with tactile with dice, with pawns, with cards. So I highly recommend if you're gonna prototype to stay away from on your first try, some of the digital prototyping platforms for, for board games and go for an actual physical prototype. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some great resources, but a really good point about having that physical prototype to test out with. Yeah, I've tested a bunch of games. I have test, tested a bunch of prototypes on those virtual platforms. And I'll tell you, I just don't have the same experience. There's something about when you're playing a board game or a card game or a non-digital game about the face-to-face -face value, being in the same room with your opponents or your, or your friends, and just seeing how everybody reacts to the moment or hearing the clack of the dice on the board, feeling the tiles that you have in your hand. There's nothing that matches that experience. Absolutely. Well, awesome. We're going to wrap up with this one last question. So Jason, what was your favorite prototype to make? Whew. Um, you know, I made a game many years ago, which never was actually the first game that I worked on even before I was at Game Right. It was a party game that never saw prime time, but it was my first foray into what it was like to make a prototype. And I remember being at first really freaked out about it because I was like, how am I going to make a box? How am I going to make a cards? Um, and then I just, and this was, this was, wow, probably more than 20 years ago. So the internet wasn't quite what it is today. The resources available to you as a prototype maker were different back then. And I just um, went to someone who I knew was good at arts and crafts and who showed me how to cut a box up actually out of a piece of cardboard. Like I went and got a flat, flat piece of cardboard and I made it my first party game, one called Adverbally, which uh, again, is not out there. It's not on the market, but it's near and dear to my heart because it was my first foray into the whole world of prototyping. That's awesome. And so inspiring for a lot of people who might be designing their very first game in the challenge that, you know, if you just jump in, you're probably going to have a really great experience. Exactly. Don't, like I said, don't fret about it. As the old saying goes, don't let perfection get in the way of a good thing. So don't be a perfectionist the first time through. You can refine and iterate, but just, just get in there and do it. Make it, make it, make it as messy as you want it to be, as long as it gets out there and you start to get some feedback on it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. Thank you all for your thoughtful questions. Um, if any other questions arise as you work through the other lessons, or if you have any other questions for Jason, you can feel free to email events at legendsoflearning.com and we'll get you an answer to any of the questions that you have. So thank you again for joining us for the presentation for lesson two, game prototyping. Good luck and have fun with the rest of the challenge. And I absolutely cannot wait to see all of your submissions on December 15th. Thanks again.